Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, today's gonna be the first of two of these units on letterpress. And we're set up in, as I said, we have this uh, about 140 year old house with a very creepy New England basement, um, but using some old camera equipment from uh, my wife who is a photographer um, and uh, a couple of cameras, I think we've been able to set up a decent printing operation. Um, when everything sort of was beginning to shut down, I reached out to the folks at the Museum of Printing which is up north of Boston. And they were the ones who helped us uh, get set up um, in the, the press uh, at Northeastern and asked them if they had anything that we could use for a kind of a home printing operation. And they, they leapt into action and were able to find this very small uh, tabletop press, which we'll learn more about next week, um, as well as a few cases of type and the kind of necessary equipment that we would need to, to print. So before we get too much further, I'm gonna introduce my assistant who's uh, playing with type. Could you say your name, bud? Hello, my name is Laura Correll. I, I don't know how well that's gonna pick up in, in the mic, which is in my headphones, but his name is Rorick. He's one of the, our twins. Uh, his twin brother may be my assistant next week, we shall see. But they've actually been to Huskyana Letter Pressing campus many times. They've been there for workshops. Um, and they know their way around type. I guess I'm, I'm teaching them a practical skill for 100 years ago, <laughs> something like that. Um, so today though, I just wanna basically introduce you to the process of setting type. So in the print shop, um, the, the jobs would have been pretty uh, divided between the different parts of the operation. You would have had the folks who, you know, the printer who is sort of an overseer of the, of the entire operation. Um, who, at least through the 18th century, was also essentially a publisher, would work with uh, authors who wanted to get things printed, um, would negotiate, you know, the, the pay for the works that were going to be published and so forth. And then you had the, the compositors, and we'll be thinking mostly about compositors today. The compositors were the folks who actually took the manuscript, the handwritten documents that were going to be printed, and uh, set them in movable type, um, prepared them essentially for printing. Um, and then you had the, the press operators and the, the folks who operated the press, that varied a bit uh, depending on what kind of press you're talking about. You know, we'll mostly be thinking about kind of early modern presses, at least in the things that we're reading um, and watching for next week. Um, most of the presses, sorry, I know that sounds like an army, but we're just in the basement. It's one of the children running over our heads. Um, <laughs> um, press operators, sorry. So, uh, you know, with, a, with an English common press or something from, you know, prior to the 18th century or prior, uh, it was a multi-person operation just to run the press. You had one person to put the paper on, one person to apply the ink, one person to close it down, and another person to pull the press. The presses that we have at Huskiana, um, which I hope, again, you'll get to see soon, uh, we will have a workshop just for y'all whenever Northeastern opens again. More 19th century presses, and they're designed to be operated by a single person who kind of is able to do all of those jobs. So we'll see that again a little bit more next week. So one of the main things that I like to start with when I talk about type is just what, what is type and what is a font? Uh, when I say the word font, people tend to think of a, uh, a menu item, you know, when they're in Google Docs or they're in Word, you pick a different font and you change the style of your letters. But during the letterpress era, the, the font was something considerably more, more weighty in a literal sense. Um, you see these drawers that I have in front of you, and you can see into one of them here in the document camera. Um, each one of these drawers is a single font. And what font means is a combination of two things. It means a combination of the type style, so the way the letters look. And um, actually, I have found this camera refocuses a bit better if I give it a kind of neutral background to work from. You can see that W there. It's a combination of the style of the letter and the size of the letter. So every size and style that you want to have, you need to have a separate drawer. So Rorik here 
is sitting in front of a drawer of 14 point Old English. So this is a, a font that is designed to look more like the fonts of say Gutenberg or something like that. It has that Old English style, although it's not precisely the same. It's a kind of 20th century interpretation of those older fonts. Um, whereas I am sitting in front of an 18 point sans serif. I don't know if I actually know the precise um, typeface. Uh, that's actually one thing about using these historical cases is that sometimes you know precisely what uh, typeface you're working with and sometimes you don't. But I do know that it's 18 point. And within a type case, every letter has a place and it's very important that they all stay together. So the case that I'm working with is what's called a California job case. And this is the layout of the California job case. I've included a link to a description of the California case in your assignment. Um, and this is a, a 19th century case design as well. Um, prior to the 19th century, there were, there were many other uh, cases and there were conventions, regional conventions, language conventions around case layout. In general, the case layouts are designed to optimize um, finding type for the language. So you'll notice that you know, the largest um, uh, sort uh, in, the, in an English case is going to be the lowercase e because there are more lowercase e's in most English documents than anything else. And printers well knew this. They knew they needed to use more E's to make those jobs. Um, the layout of your computer keyboard that you use today uh, bears a relationship to this. When they were trying to develop the layout of the typewriter in the 19th century, they turned to printer's cases to try and figure out where to put the keys because printers had a lot of knowledge about what letters uh, you know, appeared most frequently in documents. Now, if we looked at a case for a different language, if we looked at a case for Spanish or uh, uh, Russian or any other language, we would find a very different sort of layout. And, and depending on the number of characters in the language and all sorts of other things, um, for, for various reasons, movable type didn't come to uh, uh, some languages until much later. And in some languages, it's very difficult to translate the connected forms of the letters into something like movable type and movable type wasn't a practical way to, to operate. Um, and then some languages just have so many characters. I've seen a, a compositor's case for a, a Korean at one point and it's this amazing like sort of circular desk that you move around in because there are so many more character types that need to be used. Okay, so um, the California case, as I said, was a 19th century innovation, and it really um, combined what had previously been two cases. So prior to this, the, the minuscule letters, the small letters would have been in the lower case, and the capitals would have been in the upper case. And this is where those terms come from, upper and lower case. And when the compositor was sitting at their, their uh, composing table, there would have been the lower case. They sat at an angle. You can see one of these in the press if you ever get to visit us there. Um, and then the upper case is sort of angled behind it. And you'll, you can see some illustrations of that in the materials that I sent you today. Okay, so the process of making a text in the letterpress context involves putting together a lot of material objects. And I'm gonna show you a composed text to give you a sense of what that means. Give this a second to, there we go. So this is a text that I set up um, to test this equipment when we got it from the Museum of Printing. Um, you'll see it's in this very small, um, <laughs> very small uh, chase, this, uh, this metal uh, sort of outline, it's called a chase. And this is what actually holds everything together when we put it into our press. This is very small because we have a very small little postcard press that we're working with. Uh, if you were to come into Haskiana, you would find that we have much larger uh, chases for setting uh, even like poster sized um, text. Um, but within the chase, uh, every bit of the text, and I can put the, um, the thing that was printed next to it. It's just a little uh, stanza from a song <laughs> that I felt was apropos to her current moment. So if I want to make a text like this in the letterpress context, everything is material. So this line that you see, 
This is actually a little piece of metal that is the same height as the type that makes this pattern when it prints. You can see all the letters. You can see that they're a mirror image because if I'm going to make a print, uh, I want the print to be right reading, which means that the type needs to be the mirror of that. But you can see that even space in the letterpress context is a material object. These little uh, bits here, these are called coins. No, sorry, these are not called coins. These are called quads, Q-U-A-D. Um, and quads actually make the space. And you have quads of different sizes, depending on how much space you need to add. I know the lighting is getting a little, a little strange. Hang on, I might be able to help that. We'll see, that makes things too bright. We have different, we have quads that make the space between letters. And you also will see those long, long strips, this is called leading. If you've ever used a, uh, a graphic design app, you might actually still have a setting for the leading and the leading controls the space in between lines. If you want more space between lines, you have to add more leading. Now that word leading uh, comes from the fact that these are essentially strips of a lead alloy and type itself is made of an alloy of lead antimony and tin. So this always you know, sort of raises people's concerns um, when they hear lead. Um, fortunately, type lead is not the same sort of uh, lead flakes or something that you would have found in uh, paint, something that easily sort of becomes aerosol and that can be inhaled. Um, if you have a piece of type that you can see is visibly oxidizing, then it does become a concern. You have to, you have to take care of it, you have to discard it. Um, but for the most part, the, the uh, alloy, the lead antimony and tin alloy is quite stable and not too dangerous. Um, you do want to wash your hands prior to setting type and after setting type. And as I say in the print shop, you don't want to uh, suck on the type. I wouldn't use it as a lollipop, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, if you're not working in a print shop, uh, you know, full time, uh, it's unlikely to be uh, too, too hazardous to you. Some folks that do this, you know, long term will wear gloves and things like that. Um, I do have gloves in the print shop, or I did, but they are obviously, uh, there are better places for gloves to go these days. So I don't have any here. Um, so you've got the letting separating the lines, you've got the quads separating the letter. Each individual letter is referred to as a sort, and actually not even just the letter. Every character is referred to as a sort. Um, it, you may have seen in the readings that this is where that phrase out of sorts comes from, because if you're in the middle of making a, a job, a project, and all of a sudden you run out of a letter that you need, um, it's quite distressing. You, you feel a bit out of sorts. Um, and this has happened to us. We've been setting projects in the press where we didn't, you know, thoroughly count them as we probably should have before, didn't count the letter before we started and we got toward the end and realized, oh my gosh, we are gonna run out of lowercase e's. And in fact, in one case, I, I was working with a student group to print a poster um, and we just went back and forth and rewrote the text in order to save about five e's so that we could finish the text. We just found synonyms that had fewer e's in them. Yeah. <laughs> I did tell you about that before, but um, okay. Everything has to be kept nice and square too. You'll notice that you know all my lines need to end sort of at the same place. And the reason for that is that you everything has to be held together. You'll notice that what I'm holding here, this chase, this is loose type. There's not a backing on this or anything like that. What's holding it in place is pressure. So a good job of composing is gonna have everything nice and even so that I can then put it in the chase and I use furniture. That's these pieces of wood here. There's also metal furniture, although what I have is wood. And these, these are my coins. I used that word accidentally a few minutes ago, but my coins, which get tightened just a little bit and apply pressure in both directions. And that pressure keeps everything nice and together. I might actually have a little bit too much pressure here. You can see a little bit of a bend in the, uh, in the bottom. I wouldn't really want that for a professional project. Some of my more experienced letterpress folks are probably howling as they see that in this video, if they see that in this video. Okay, um, 
those are the basics. So what I want to show you uh, in the last couple of minutes and what Rourke is going to help me with is how I would set a line of type. And in the assignment for today, I'm going to ask you to go to this sort of simulator and, and simulate setting a line of type. It will not be. <laughs> oh, you all right? Yep, just a sneeze. All right. It will not be as satisfying as you know getting to do it yourself and seeing it printed. But again, we will save that for the future. So here, Rourke, I've given you a compositor stick. I will put this to the side. And I'm going to show you what this process looks like. Oh, you know, while I'm getting set up, I can show you some folks might be wondering about images. How do images get printed in the letterpress context? And the answer to that is with what are called woodcuts. Now that's got stylized text and an image in it. And these are just the few that I was able to get from the museum. I'm trying to get the, the lighting good on these so you can see them. But essentially, these are the same height as type. And they get locked in with the type and printed simultaneous to the type. Now, there are other methods of making images. Uh, you know, engravings that are more detailed, but those get printed in a separate process. So it becomes a two process print. All right, I see that I have a question. So I'm going to cycle over and look at that real quick. Sorry, what are those called again? You mean the images, Maximo? Yeah, the images. Uh, the name for the, uh, the general name for the images is a woodcut. Um, and they keep using that term woodcut even when the uh, images are made out of metal. They're sometimes carved out of metal. But the most cost effective way of carving them would have been out of wood. Um, there's also wood type. Some of the bigger stylized type that you sometimes uh, see is wood type. Is this a D? That is a D. Yeah, it looks like a D. Sorry, you've got the old English type, so it looks kind of funny, doesn't it? All right. <laughs> Great. All right. So da, 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 let me close that. I, you know, one thing I didn't mention here, I mean, this is a historical technology, but one thing we have seen lately is a kind of resurgence of interest in letterpress. Um, and it's come along with the resurgence of interest in a lot of other kind of hand uh, crafts. Um, the most typical what places that you see letterpress these days are in like wedding announcements, uh, birth announcements, uh, documents that are produced to mark, you know, occasions, but there are also plenty of people who make letterpress for decorative reasons for business cards um, and, and other things like that. Um, there are quite a few letterpress shops around the Boston Providence area um, that are sort of regular businesses. I mean, it's not a um, the dominant way that the books are published. There are still artist books made in this way, um, but it has sort of found its, its niche. And that's, again, thinking about the way that media works. Um, it's rarely the case that, you know, some new medium emerges and then the prior medium entirely disappears. What tends to happen is that the media ecosystem shifts um, and it, we find sort of new uh, places for different media. And, and letterpress is in that, that sort of situation right now. It's actually had a real resurgence in the last decade or so. So when a compositor was going to set type, they would start with the composing stick. The composing stick looks like this. It's adjustable. And the first thing I'm going to figure out is how wide my text block is going to be. The text block is going to determine, that's the sort of length of the line, essentially. And I might pick the length of the line based on the document. If I'm printing a book with two columns, I, I might know precisely how wide the columns of that book need to be. Or I might determine the width based on the, the text itself. Maybe I'm printing poetry and I pick the longest line of the poem and I choose to use that as my line length. Um, in this case, we're going to stick with one line length. We're up here, piece of lead. You didn't put any lead in. You always start with lead. You remember how I said that everything has to be square. We have to be able to exert pressure on it. If I just start putting loose type in here, then when I try and pull it out, all that type is just going to fall over. I need a buttress for it. I need a piece of leading that will help hold it in place. So I always start with a piece of leading. And then I start to set the type and I want to look closely at the type to show you what will help me set it. So let's say I was going to set the name of our letterpress studio, Huskyana. I'm going to want to start with an uppercase 
H, right? On the type, you'll see that there's a little, that little indentation right there that's called the nick. Now, uh, people sometimes think that that like attaches to something or it helps lock the type in. It's not for that. It's really just to tell me where the bottom of the sort is. Because just like when you're typing, you don't have to look at your keyboard. Uh, a very skilled compositor would not have spent a lot of time looking at, at their hands as they were pulling uh, type out of the type case. They would have been able to do it by feel. And they would have used that nick to tell them where the bottom of the type is. When I set my type, I set it upside down and essentially uh, backward. <laughs> so this is a confusing part. But I want the nick to be facing upward. And <laughs> Ooh, all right. As I set these, I'm going to want to be able to see a nice line of nicks across the type as I set. So I'm going to start with that H. It's a little awkward doing this while trying to sort of hold it where folks can see, but I'm going to do my best. Do the nicks go this way? And then I would get a lower case U. Yeah, I apologize for my. Is this the right way? Yep, all your nicks are lined up. Perfect, bud. That's exactly right. And then I'm going to get an S. I apologize. We'll move around a little bit in kind of a weird way. In fact, I will maybe pull away for a second while I do this. And then I will put it back under once I have it set. I, I don't quite have the case entirely memorized. I do have to look over occasionally. But I've been doing it now for like teaching purposes that I am beginning to learn the case. All right, so I've gotten to the end of Huskiana, H-U-S-K-I-A-N-A, -A. <laughs> if you can read that in, in its form here. Um, one thing to keep in mind, another phrase that comes from the print shop, because you're working in reverse image, if you look at that letter right there, your brain wants to say that that is a Q, but we're in mirror. This is a P. Mind your P's and Q's. Um, and you need to do that because even though you know you're working in mirror image, uh, your brain will tell you, oh, that's a, that's a Q. And you'll put it in the wrong place either when you're putting the type into the stick or when you're putting the type back into the case. Um, inevitably, when we, when we print a proof in the shop, uh, we will run a proof and we will see that there are some backward B's and D's, which look like each other, but in mirror or P's and Q's. All right, so I've come to the end of my word. And again, what I need is a space. I can't just sort of move over and start putting writing letterpress, because if I do that, when I try and exert pressure to hold all this together, that space will collapse. So I have to have an object. I put a quad in here and you'll notice the quad is not as tall as the type. That is so when the printer comes and makes contact, um, it will not print that space, but the space will help hold everything together. I'm sorry, I know that gets a little weird. It's trying to focus on two things at once. I'll put that down. All right, so now if I, uh, sorry, put that down real quick so it can focus. Brilliant. You can see what that looks like. You'll notice that it's nice and square at the bottom. You see that nice line of nicks there. That tells me that everything is oriented correctly. I haven't turned anything over the wrong way. And now I'm going to write letterpress. And then I will show you how we sort of end a line. And that is where we will leave things for today. And you, I will turn you over to the activity that I have put on the Canvas site. Got my letter. All right, now I need to do a P. So again, I want to make sure it looks like a Q to my eye. That tells me that it's really a P. P R P and then two S's. All right, letterpress. So I've got that set now. 
Now you'll notice that I haven't gone to the end of my line. If I knew that this is the length that my line needs to be, then I need to fill to the end of the line with quads, right? To balance it all out. Now, what would I do folks if I wanted to center this? I'm gonna ask the folks who are here. So right now I can put some quads in here until I get it flush to the end. How would I make sure that it was centered? Work, how would I make sure it was centered? Uh, what if I wanted my text to be in the middle? You would make another piece of lead on the other side? Yeah, right, I put space on both sides. I'd even it out, right? I get even quads. I would get even quads and I would build it out on either side with even spacing in order to make my centered text. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit messy as I do this, but again, trying to both demo it and do it at the same time. I will get better. I've just never done a virtual demo like this before. I'm really pleased with this document camera. It came just yesterday, just in the nick of time to be able to do this sort of like close up demonstration. All right. So now I've got lead on both sides, evil, e uh, evil lead, <laughs> even uh, quads on both sides. Come on, there we go. And now to move on to my next line, I would just get another piece of lead. Or again, if I wanted more space between this line and the next, I would get multiple pieces of lead. And I would put multiple pieces of lead there to separate these. That is the basics of composing. And I'm gonna keep doing that essentially until I build up the full text block that I want to print. Now, one thing that I cannot really convey to you is the weight of this. This is heavy already. Just this little text of four lines already has a heft to it. So if you can imagine a whole page of this, and I'll share some pictures of some of the pages we've composed in the press, um, you get a sense of the, the weight <laughs> of textual creation in the letterpress period. It's quite a different uh, sort of operation. And imagine if like you drop that entire page. Yeah, do you know what that's called? What? So when, do you know what it's called when the letters just go everywhere? What? You've pied the type. Pied <laughs> type is the disaster of the print shop because you have to then pick it up and put it back. <laughs> yeah, I can show you. There are people who wrote about like how terrible it was when the type dropped like that. Oh, can we see what you've been composing? Uh, I'm just gonna carry this over real quick. So Rorik is working. A little bit catch as catch can. He's working with the old English type, but he's getting there. All right, bud. I'm just trying to get there. I guess the last thing that I'll show you is that if a line of type is well composed, then again, you should be able to, uh, even though it is loose type, exert pressure. You see, I can put my hands, my fingers around this, and I can exert pressure and I can move it even though it is loose. If I let go, it would scatter, it would pie. I don't want pie type right now. Okay, folks, this is our first letterpress sort of demonstration. My idea is that next week, we will actually show you um, how to print. We'll use the little Kelsey press that we have up here and we'll actually make some prints to show you what that process looks like. But in the meantime, we've got, I've got an activity that I posted for you on the, the course canvas. And if you have any questions, I'll, I'll actually, any questions before we dismiss from the folks who are here with us live. Uh, obviously, if you're watching this afterwards, if you're doing this asynchronously, then you can send me questions or pop, pop, pop them into the course chat or something like that. But do we have any questions from those live before I, before I shut things off? How were they actually printed then? Yeah, so again, we will we'll mostly do that next week, uh, Maximo, but I will just briefly show you that I would take my form of type that I was showing you, and this actually gets um, 
there's a it gets locked into my press up here and then ink gets applied to the surface of the type and the press comes and presses the paper onto the surface of the type which transfers the ink where the letters or the images or the outlines are and it sort of transfers it to the paper and then you re-ink the type and you put another piece the printer that I'm using here actually sort of automates that. It re-inks the type between every pull automatically. Um, back in the early modern period up to the 18th century, um, there would have been a person who applied the ink between each pull. Um, but we don't, this, this printer allows one person to do sort of all those steps. I'll, I'll keep it pretty vague for now. You'll see it directly uh, next Tuesday when we do the second of these sessions. What does point in type size refer to? Yeah, that's great. Um, it's just a unit of measurement. <laughs> um, you know what, I didn't talk about that too much. Um, so, you know, this is 18, you know, let me turn my document camera back on real quick. Right, okay. So like I said, this is um, 18 point type. If I find an M, do you know where the upper case M is? Just use, Just use these O's. All right. This is uh, 14 point type. So you can see that they are, you know, that the height is different. Point size refers essentially to the height of the, uh, of the sort. Um, and these all need to line up. So you can't in one line easily, I shouldn't say you can't, you can't easily mix point sizes in a single line. If you did want to mix point sizes, like let's say I wanted to use an 18 point leading letter. I've just written moo. We've just written moo. That's good. No, this is a good example. Thank you. Inadvertently, you <laughs> we made a great word. All right. So we've written moo. If I wanted to write moo and let's say I wanted that M to be kind of a you know big capital followed by smaller letters, then I would need to run a thin strip of lead along the top of the 14 point type in order to make it square. And lead comes in different thicknesses. If we were in the shop, you could see that we have lots of different thicknesses of lead and lengths of lead. Um, and that's how I would have to do it, sort of like assembling a puzzle. But in general, yeah, so this won't be the perfect size, but I could run a piece of lead. Thank you, man. Work is really being my, you know what I failed to mention what Rorik would have been in the print shop. So I talked about compositors. I talked about the folks who worked the press. Um, there would also have been, because uh, child labor laws were not what they were, what were referred to as printer's devils. And printer's devils were folks about Rorik's age or even a little younger who did a lot of the sort of tasks in the office. They carried things from here to there. They were sort of apprenticing in the shop, but they did a lot of the sort of tasks that the other folks didn't want to do. They would go out and get a, a hard cider or a beer for the folks working in the press because they also did a lot of drinking on the job back in the day. Um, I mean, how did they focus on like lettering down type? Well, that's a good question, man. It's a good question. Ben Franklin talks about how frustrated he was with all the folks drinking on the job uh, when he was a printer. Um, so you can see we could sort of line it up that way, but point size, uh, here's your O's back. Oh, just the O's. Awesome. Point size just refers to the, to the height and it really wasn't standardized um, until the 19th century, this like 1824, so on and so forth, until we had sort of industrial pr production of type where there were big foundries making type and shipping them to lots of folks. Um, for most of the hand press era, these were more local operations and presses would have had different sizes, but they referred to them with actual uh, word names, um, brevier, um, things like this. And they were sort of relative in the shop, like all of the brevier size, you know, in a particular shop needed to be the same size, but it wasn't necessarily true that it was standard across, you know, all the shops everywhere. Um, the point sizes really come in with industrialization and, and a bit later. And they probably do, like most measurements, have a, um, a standard somewhere that folks were comparing them to, but I don't know it off the top of my head, to be quite honest with you. It was a long answer, but it, it made me think of a few other things. Any other questions from folks who are here live before we before we turn off the recording? All 
Oh, you know what? I kept saying that was Maximo. That was Rayan. Sorry, I'm trying to negotiate between a few different screens here. Rayan asked a question about point size. Thank you, Rayan. That's a great question. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions from the folks live, but you've got an activity to do, and you can feel free to shoot me questions uh, in other contexts. Thank you very much, Rourke. Appreciate okay. your help, sir. <laughs> all right. And I will talk to you all. Uh, well, I'll talk to you all in person next week. All right. Bye.